industrial complex is one in which you will find a lot of the prisons that are being built or have been built uh, in rural white communities that has been devastated from the uh, removal of the blue collar factors, the manufacturing industry that went either to China or to India or to Mexico or that it was uh, basically shipped offshore for a cheap labor force. Uh, it devastated those rural areas uh, and it left large uh, segments of the population unemployed. Uh, it also devastated the urban communities that uh, had a lot of the blue collar workers in the various factories. Uh, so you had two unemployed populations and now you build prisons in the rural areas and you employ the uh, unemployed population in the rural areas that uh, becomes guards, become teachers, become medical staff, become maintenance people, become supplier of goods. And then at the same time, you incarcerate at an enormous rate the urban populations who's also unemployed and they become prisoners and they are housed in those areas and uh, in many cases they are counted as population of those rural areas and federal funds and state funds and local funds go uh, to those municipalities for both populations uh, and it, it devastates the urban communities and the uh, uh, inner city communities where the, the actual captive population comes from and it, it, it further debilitates the ability to have a community uh, and to have a community that's, that's somewhat intact with fathers, uh, mothers, sisters, brothers, uh, uncles and aunts uh, uh, disappearing from the community at an alarming rate. And it's, it's really kind of like the final kind of thing that uh, uh, capitalism can do when it when it, it runs out of its ability to continue to employ people in a profitable middle way for the ruling class and the people that own means of production and uh at this point they have they have no use for that broad workforce other than to use the prisons uh uh, for to control both communities and at the same time try and and successfully uh, uh, execute a a sense of divide and conquer in terms of race relationships and people working together white people as uh, uh, and black people together to look at the real issues of why they're in poverty or why they're in conflict. All right, surprise. We are here Saturday and we're back again. We weren't around last week because Pascal and I were both uh, excommunicated from Facebook. So we wanted to take a little bit of a break <laughs> and let things cool over for a little bit. But we are back and we have a special guest today for this Saturday show. Uh, but first, let me introduce my co host, my homie, my dog. Writer for Black Agenda Report, Huffington Post, and numerous other publications. Also working for, or, or working on his his new book. Do we have a title for the book yet? We don't have a title for the book yet. It's in oh. the progress. Okay, okay. We we've, we've been in talks with Zero Books about publishing yes. Pascal's work. I'm putting him on the spot now because I want him to really crank this damn book out. <laughs> Pascal Robert. What's going on, brother Jason? How you living, brother? I'm doing all right. The gentleman that you guys heard in that in that opening clip uh, is our guest today. Uh, head, I believe he was the head of the Black Panther Party in Baltimore, uh, wrongfully convicted and uh, and wrongfully incarcerated for 43 years. Author and co-author of two books. He's also the host and producer of uh, was it Rattling the Bars on the Real News. Mr. Eddie Conway. All right. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Conway. Yeah. Thank you for uh, for joining us today. Uh, how are you on this lovely it's afternoon where you are? It is the morning where I am here in Oakland, California. 
How is it? Is it snowing out there in Baltimore? No, no. Actually, it's just a little chilly, but it's a really nice day. So as soon as I get away from this podcast, <laughs> I'm going outside. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, after after being locked in for 44 years, you can't get enough of outside. You know, uh, you know, you can't just to be able to walk among the trees and watch the birds and the rest of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. So, so Pascal, you want to go ahead and start it off? I mean, I just to to to, to contemplate the 44 years. Given to the state unjustifiably because of your political convictions and being wrongly targeted, can you can, can you I mean can you just talk to us in terms of as a coming out of the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. you know what it meant to have to face the reprisal of the state mm -hmm. in that way based on the politics that you were trying to demonstrate at that time. Uh, well, I, you know, I think it's important to know that throughout our history, there's always been resistance, you know, and when we get our history, we always get the history of us being captured in Africa, us being transported across the Atlantic, us being held in slavery and some kind of way the Civil War miraculously kind of freed us. But there's a history that's not told. And, you know, and I, to some degree, I, I blame the, the black uh, petty bourgeoisie, black bourgeoisie, the intellectuals for not writing, not reporting, not looking at and documenting the history of resistance. Black people have been resisting. That spirit of resistance goes back all the way to the, the ship. To the, to the shores of Africa, really, and to the ships. But so the Black Panther Party, I think, was born out of that spirit of resistance that Black people have always had, whether it was Charles Delon in the uh, New Orleans in the uh, 1800s, uh, whether it was uh, 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 David Walker's appeal, whether it was uh, um, Nat Turner, et cetera. You know, I mean, there's just, even Annie that rode out of the plantation on the back of a, a, a horse after she poisoned her master, that resistance always been there. So I think the Black Panther Party grew out of that resistance. And I think that resistance always take into consideration that you are challenging oppression, you are challenging somebody that's heavily armed, that's oppressing your people. And there's always that possibility of death. And I think in the Black Panther Party's capitalists, it was like, okay, the civil rights movement, uh, people end up in the bottom of the uh, uh, rivers, they end up hanging off of ropes and trees, they end up being shot in their driveway. So the Black Panther Party said, well, okay, we want to organize but we'll probably end up dead. So at least we're gonna fight back and we're gonna resist. And I think our calculus probably failed when we did not consider to being locked up, being captured. I think, I think if you walk into the Black Panther Party office, you know there might be a possibility of an attack on the office, a shootout, or you ending up dead. <clears throat> and so on. But in terms of being set up, framed, you know, uh, uh, infiltrated and manipulated like, like the Black Panther was as a result of COINTELPRO, I think that was something we realized could happen, but we did not see the power of the empire. I think we were looking at America and Maybe to some degree, maybe to some degree, we believe that the American population and the American people would see the injustice and push back against it when we didn't consider the role of the media. We didn't consider the role of the petty bourgeoisie in 
collaborating. Uh, we didn't see the role of uh, mass psychology in terms of at that time when we were organizing, if it was reported on television, if it was in the news, uh, it was legit. Uh, so-and-so said it, they validated it, then it must have happened. And what we discovered was that all of the stuff that was being reported was lies. And they controlled the media, even though we had our own paper, we could not, we could reach hundreds of thousands of people, but we could not reach hundreds of millions of people. And the media every day was doing that. And so we considered dying, but we never considered the level of destruction uh, with these uh, counterintelligence programs mm. uh, that existed. And uh, so we were watched. We were, you know, obviously we were harassed. We were watched. We were uh, followed around. Uh, <clears throat> but when people start disappearing, which happen all too frequently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of the narrative was, well, okay, maybe they just got tired and they just moved on. Or maybe they were in trouble and they went underground or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was only later that we found out a lot of people came up missing because the government was having them eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in a lot of cases, they were using even some of our people to do it uh, under the auspices that that person is a spy or that person is an uh, agent. And uh, like in the case of Baltimore, say, friend, oh, and, and for point of clarification, I was just one of the leaders of the Baltimore, the Maryland chapter. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't uh, sure. Uh, but, and we had many leaders, apparently. <laughs> uh, and a lot of us disappeared or had to leave town or end up doing something else, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the, the whole, the whole way in which organizations, our organizations were infiltrated, mm -hmm. uh, it was like not one agency, not the national security agency or the FBI or the, the state police or the local police or the county police. It was just all kinds of agencies. And they were in there fighting each other or blaming each other to keep the weight and attention off of this song. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it caused all kinds of internal corruption and chaos within the organization itself because you didn't know who to trust. And, and uh, I saw, uh, 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 sorry to, so to cut you off. Okay. No, go I ahead. wanted to ask you this question. I, I saw an interview you did uh, maybe a couple months ago on uh, Chris Hedges on contact show. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you brought up something pretty interesting about how hard it is to run an organization when you think everybody inside is, is a plant. And, <laughs> and I, yeah. and I thought about that and, and, and it really, it really struck me because I'm, I'm watching this interview with you um after we've already spoken with uh fred hampton's lawyers uh, uh flint taylor and, and jeff haas mm -hmm. and they're telling us things that we did not know uh about chicago at that time because they they were based out of chicago and i'm sure baltimore chicago oakland mm -hmm. they're all very similar when it comes to being infiltrated <coughs> and when they brought up the point that uh the gentleman and i get it, william o'neill i think is his name mm -hmm. The, the the snitch, if you will, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was a pallbearer at Fred Hampton's funeral. It's yeah. it was appalling. And to know that there's this movie coming out with an amazing actor, Lakeith Stanfield, playing him, that's probably going to you know bring a lot of, of of a human touch to this person's uh, role. And then hearing you make that statement about, you know, kind of looking over your shoulder and and now you know so many years after the fact you know almost 50 years after the, the the party is over we're seeing all these stories of well this person was a was a was a plant and this guy was getting fed bad information from these people because mm -hmm. they wanted to break the party up mm -hmm. it seems like it was probably was there a lot of infighting for a while because of all that stuff no you know <clears throat> the real problem uh was that the 
the party touched the nerve of the black community and it touched the nerve of the empire. The black community actually rushed to join the party. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in in uh, there was 37 chapters, uh, 37 state chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, and people joined in such in mass mm -hmm. that there was no time for education. There was no time to build the cadre. There was gotcha. no time to to vet and and secure the the personnel that was operating. Um, mm -hmm. And it was it was just a constant bombardment of people joining, and it expanded too way too fast uh, for the for the benefit of being effective. Uh, and because of that expansion, it was easy to infiltrate agents and provocateurs, mm -hmm. and uh, just um, there, there's obviously even some people in the movement that's sick, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we want to be seen, right? Uh, so it was, it, the expansion was too big, uh, too fast. And then the, be, because of the concern and the well being of the Black community mm -hmm. and the things that the party was doing and advocating, mm -hmm. it panicked the empire in such a way where they pulled out their, uh, uh, I, I, it's actually a World War II counterintelligence program, this COINTELPRO thing. Yes. Yeah. And they use it against Nazi Germany and Italy and so on. Mm -hmm. They pulled out their war plan mm -hmm. uh, and directed it at the Black Panther Party, which was probably never any larger at any given time than maybe seven to 10,000 people. It's hard to tell what the numbers are because the transitions were constant. Um, where people were coming in, people were going out and so on. But it, it, it was a small apparatus that was confronted with 5 million military personnel mm -hmm. and about 10 million agents, intelligence, uh, operations, uh, and police department forces. You know, so uh, it, it was just really, we were outnumbered, outgunned, uh, and in the midst of that, the amount of money that was spent on the propaganda to turn the churches against us, mm. which all of them didn't turn against us. Some of them came to supported us, uh, but to turn the democratic organizations against us, the civic organizations, the the, the Greek organizations, and so on, uh, to make us look like, well, they're crazy. They're like, Nat Turner, they are always doing stuff mm -hmm. when actually stuff was being done to us and we were just resisting and pushing back. Uh, but the, I guess the threat from the, the poorest segment of the population, the most oppressed segment of the population mm -hmm. was such that if we had been successful in organizing and Fred, definitely Fred Hampton was the primary example of that, organizing poor whites, organizing Puerto Ricans, organizing uh, uh, Latinos, organizing uh, uh, senior citizens, uh, gays, etc. If we had been successful, mm -hmm. and to, uh, it would have destroyed the empire, and mm -hmm. we would have another world today, <laughs> right now. And so they had to, you know, they're as desperate today now as they was then. Mm -hmm. So what we saw then, we can look forward to seeing now. Because this is this is the this is the fork in the road right here. Mm -hmm. This is what we were talking about 50 years ago. We're at the front door of that now. And yeah. there's gonna be some reaction from the ruling class because it's either we're coming for them or they're mm -hmm. gonna have us come for each other. And I, I, I think I should have a cheerful note on this, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think I think Brother Pascal probably has uh, something he wants to add on to that ruling class uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I feel that, and and Pascal, I'm sure you agree with me. There is a black ruling class uh, that definitely I feel like they are trying to neutralize any movement. Did you want to 
kind of add on to that? Yeah, one of the questions that I wanted to ask um, Brother Eddie <clears throat> was about the way in which since the rise of President Obama and now with Kamala Harris, all of that history of rebellion or the what some call the Black Liberation Struggle is being used to reconcile with American exceptionalism, i.e. with Black faces in high places, the first Black president, the first Black vice president, the first Black senator from Georgia, a uh, Warnock. In other words, there's this now this celebratory tone that we're seeing amongst the Black political class rising in officialdom that is marshalling this legacy that you're talking about a resistance and trying to reconcile it with American empire and its face to American exceptionalism. And I'd like you to talk as someone who's watching that transpire, who lived through that period of resistance. If you can comment on what your thoughts are on that, and I'm sure you notice it, I'd love to hear what your, what your opinion is. Well, I, you know, the, 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 the reality is in, when you're working for the empire, and we're talking about Obama now, you know, if you look at what's happening as opposed to what's being said, he was smooth. He was, you know, uh, had had really good communication skills, but he destroyed most of Northern Africa with the death of Gaddafi. He was talking about banning after Mike Brown's uh, uh, murder, banning uh, giving military uh, arms to the police department. But in fact, he gave six times more military equipment to the police departments than the previous five presidents before him. So I, what does that mean in numbers? Collectively, the five presidents before him gave $500 million worth of military equipment to the police departments. He came in and within eight years gave $3 billion, six times that amount, $3 billion worth of military equipment to the police department while he was telling us that he's banning this or he's banning that. The police department and those forces that we see now with the tanks, the bulletproof vests, the AR-15s, et cetera, that's his doing. He did that. And, 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 and this is what happens when the empire is desperate and when the ruling class is desperate, they go to whoever is the safe bet to, to distract the population, you know? And of course we know in 08, there was a major desperation there with the economy and so on, but Africa was trying to, to get its act together. The forces around the world was trying to get their act together, South America and so on. They use, they use Obama, those people, to recolonize Africa, to, to rock us back to sleep, to gain control, to let the empire gain control again. And then they did something quietly, which he signed that we never paid too much attention to. And it's called the National Defense Authorization Act, 2012. And what it said was that the government can designate anybody in the world as a threat to America and the military can detain them and keep them indefinitely and their families, their lawyers, they have no rights whatsoever. And the exception was that, okay, but not American citizens. Four years later in 2016, the, the defense, Authorization Act of America made the exception obsolete for American citizens. And now, right now, anybody, everybody on the planet have lost their rights, including American citizens who have no rights for habeas corpus or any of that stuff anymore 
if the president designates you as a threat to one of his the attorney general or whoever, you know. So that act actually gives full dictatorial powers. You can disappear into one of the 800 military bases around the world, never be seen or heard from again, and no one will know what happened to you. So it's those kind of faces and images that's being pushed in front of us. Harris is the same thing. Harris is responsible for the prison industrial complex explosion in California. Uh, she played a key role in that. Biden also played a key role in it all the way back into the 95 uh, crime bill, uh, uh, criminal reform bill, so on. Uh, and so what happens is that we hear all of these things and they sound good, but they rock us back to sleep. And that's what's getting ready to happen now. It's like everything's back to normal, go back to sleep. The only problem they have with that right now is that they're part of the movement, the, the fascist part of the movement that they always keep and they always use against different various groups. They use, you know, the, the fascists we see today were the Kluka clans that we saw hundreds of years ago. The, uh, the fascists that we see today, honestly, was Columbus and Cortez that the indigenous population seen hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The fascists we see today is the same people that the World War I uh, uh, anti-war people seen. Uh, the, you know, and so on. And so they bring them out whenever there's trouble, whenever there's desperation, they wipe out a population and then they say business as usual. And so now we're at the point where they have brought them out and there's going to be a clash and uh, people on the left and people in general that want to see a better and a different world need to start thinking in terms of how they're going to protect themselves, defend themselves, and build systems that will support their survival because this, this, is, this is a crossroads here. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but the, they 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 use our ruling class to rock us to sleep. And that's when I early on when I was saying they don't they write books, they tell stories, they present our history, but they leave out what's really happening to us and what we're doing about it. And it's that omission that makes us think that, well, okay, things are gonna get better gradually, little by little. Uh, and it's true, things have gotten better for them, but for the majority of us down on the ground, things have gotten horrible. Uh, we're dying, our children are dying, we're drugged to death, we're losing our properties, we've lost most of our wealth from the Civil War. Uh, so things for us has on the ground been bad. But so it, so it is in the white community. They just give them something else to focus their attention on. All uh, right. I appreciate that answer. Thank you very much. Uh, someone says, Riverman says, uh, distraction by empires on steroids with Biden-Harris. The empire is in decline and now is asking people like Harris, Carmona, Hagland uh, of Jamaican, Indian, Puerto Rican, and Native heritage to, to sustain it. Um, I agree. And and I wanted to ask both of you guys this question, uh, see how you felt about this. So with the storming of the Capitol on the 6th, uh, and, and I know one of our friends of the show and also Zero Books uh, show host Derek Varn has talked about it uh, quite a bit, is that there's going to be people want more laws and sure. there's enough laws on the books <laughs> if you want to arrest these people as they've been arresting the, the you know these people on laws that exist and people are asking for more laws against protesters that we generally see 
aimed back at us. For example, I started the show off talking about how Pascal and I were erased from Facebook. Facebook has still erased my uh, my initial personal profile that I've had for over 10 years. Uh, but after Trump got the boot, and I think the My Pillow guy might have got the boot too, um, a bunch of leftists got the boot. And even shows like your your own uh, brother Conway, they suppress it in searches. You know, Google suppresses it in searches. If I watch two episodes of the Real News, Google gives me Fox News. Mm-hmm. You know that that's not how the algorithm's supposed to work. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so, uh, what do you? How do you guys feel about the fact that when situations like this happen, and however you feel about, however you feel about with the with the storm of the Capitol on the six, the next step always seems to be neutralizing real movements, right? Because those guys, at the end of the day, they got in the Capitol, they're taking selfies, you know, they defecated on the floor. They, 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 they didn't understand the scope, the magnitude of what they had done because that wasn't part of their, they they really had no idea what they were going to do anyway. Some of them, not all of them. Um, And now I I feel like this is going to be pointed right back at a lot of these black lives matter protesters, uh, people protesting student loan debt. Now we have in, in my state of California, uh, we have a horrible housing uh, crisis out here. And we had a horrible housing crisis well before COVID. And now that so many homeless people are 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 kept out of the all these vacant houses, because the statistic is true, there's more vacant property here than there is homeless people. Uh, some homeless people were commandeering uh, houses that were vacant, that were owned by either the state or corporations. And we saw on Thanksgiving the state <laughs> come in and literally yank them out, uh, uh, children getting handcuffed and, and things like that. So I feel like these these laws that they create uh, after something like that insurrection happens will definitely get shot back at us. What, what is your guys feeling on that? I totally agree. I think that that the nature of the state in terms of its handling repression under the guise of fighting the the reactionary right wing is a charade. The ultimate goal is suppress any kind of actual uh, resistance that disturbs empire. And the right wing is not actually trying to disturb empire. They're trying to reshape empire according to its original manifestation, which is, you know, the whole kind of Back to the narrative of of you know racial exclusion and uh, and, uh, and zealotry and those things as well. But you're talking about people who are trying to challenge capitalism, imperialism, and racism in this country. Then those rule those new laws are going to be designed to neutralize those people, which is going to be the left. It's going to be black folk, brown folk, uh, white folk in solidarity trying to challenge and challenge to challenge empire, and they're going to feel we, we, we're going to feel the brunt of it more so than the reactionary right by far. Yeah, and, and I agree. I definitely agree with that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you can see it, uh, the death penalty, say, for instance, in uh, 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 being used by the state. You know, they open up the death penalty with some horrible uh, Ted Bundy kind of case, some white person that everybody's jumping up and down and saying, kill him, kill him. And 10 cases later, there's nothing but black bodies and brown bodies and indigenous bodies being killed. Uh, this has always been the case. And this is the case today, as, as you point out, uh, there is a threat to the ruling class. You know, the ruling class uh, is, is very tiny and there's people around the world. This is not just, this is a global situation here is people around the world are living on two dollars a day or starving to death and they're making their way to the centers of the empire uh, because the conditions in their particular areas are so bad because the empire have exploited the resources of the whole entire planet 
Now, they are looking to change this condition. And people are organizing and talking about changing and talking about ways to change it. And the ruling class can see that. And they use their right wing components. Mm -hmm. They use their government components because they control the government. They control, you know, if you're in the Senate, you're a millionaire. And if you're not a millionaire in a couple of years, you will be. You know, <laughs> so you'll be part of that clear. Mm -hmm. And they use those apparatus. And what they realize is that people are coming for them. They realize it and they real and that's why that <clears throat> that law that Obama signed is there. That's why three billion dollars worth of military equipment has been given to the police departments. That's why the the right wing stormtroopers on the ground, the brown shirts, the idiots have been unleashed because they know that they have to suppress this movement of people that are no longer employed, that are no longer, uh, and, and, and this is communications. Communications, it's, it's, it's a very important tool here. And people, social media, podcasts, et cetera, they're using that media to educate their self, but also to look around the world and people around the world are starting to look back at the centers of the empire and say, we need to fix this. And that's the fear. So they want to put as many laws in place directed at the brown shirts that will eventually suppress the movement. The mm -hmm. only problem with that is that the, the movement itself can't be suppressed that way because there's too many problems on the ground. We're hungry, we're unemployed, we're abused, we're locked up, mm -hmm. we're oppressed, we're homeless, we don't have medication, mm -hmm. we're not even getting the vaccine. Mm -hmm. You know, that on the ground, the situation is so dire that no matter how many people they lock up, they're just gonna change the mentality of the populations in the jails mm -hmm. and prisons and by putting political activists and agitators in there, and then more people are gonna come out. And so, so this is desperation. And this is desperation that's gonna lead to a clash of wills at some point. Oh, I, I agree. We got a comment from Joe G. Uh, K. For the left, the algorithms are no gorithms. Uh, Joe, are you related to Harvey J. K.? That'd be funny if you if you are his brother. Uh, and then we have Riverman. After the summer protests, often attributed to BLM, the security state knew it was being challenged. The January 6th incident was perfect to deter the earlier sentiments. Police is now necessary again. Um, Evan Moore. Facts. Bless this space. Coming from Left Flank, flank Vets. Shout out to Left Flank Vets. Uh, earlier this week, peace and power, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate that, man. And uh, and Ben is listening. Um, I the, the summer protests were an interesting time to me because it's always a mixed bag, right? There's people that are legitimately upset. This was the first time we had uh, a lockdown like that. I think some of it was probably due the, the explosion of it, the way we saw it, right? This ain't the first time. Uh, the police have killed brothers on on TV. What really frustrates the hell out of me, I don't know if you guys feel the same way, is that we have to watch these these snuff films ad nauseum, right? With with George Floyd, there was no footage of Breonna Taylor. Kind of thank God. Uh, seeing Rodney King get his behind kick over and over again in the nineties. Uh, uh, the gentleman in New York, uh, Eric Gardner, getting choked out by the police. You, you get tired of watching people die on camera. And then when the when the insurrection happened at the Capitol, the one woman that actually got shot in the head, again, it's, it's disgustingly gruesome to see this kind of stuff. They pulled that from the Internet. Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. So the theory becomes that, you know, the spectacle... You know, we we always talk about before about the reducing of black life to spectacle. Mm -hmm. So even the death of black people is easily reduced to spectacle 
and made fodder for uh, morose entertainment, if you will, mm -hmm. if you think about it, is that, you know, even in death, folks are not given the dignity that they would normally deserve and are just rendered to be fodder for an almost kind of perverse entertainment. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, and and it, it, I don't know if you guys feel the same way. And but but let me add, and just, just let me add something because that's a good point you're making there, and it's designed to desensitize us. Mm -hmm. It's designed to tune us out from this stuff. It's like enough. I had enough. I don't want to watch it. Uh, uh, but the fact of the matter is, and I think the grassroots, uh, uh, Malcolm X grassroots movement did the research. Uh, Every 18 hours, one black man, woman, or child is killed by law enforcement, police, correctional officers, security, et cetera. In America, every 18 hours, every 18 hours since 1900, since Ida B. Wells was watching this, you know, uh, and it's still happening today. It hasn't stopped, but they want to desensitize us so that we can say, let's move on. Let's get over that and let's go somewhere. But it's not going away. It didn't go away, you know. And um, that's that's an important thing to, to actually stop us from watching it and stop us from being aware of it because it's it's just it's too overwhelming. And at some point, we tune out. Yeah, because it it. it, it what really got me, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way or if anybody listening feels the same way. I mean, definitely chime in on the chat. This is a very interactive program. Um, when the gentleman, Philando Castile, got killed in, in Minneapolis, that really uh, hit me because I have had, as probably several people listening, have had guns pulled on me by law enforcement. And the worst experience I had was when uh, the SWAT team came down when I had a flat tire on tour mm -hmm. and uh, I toured with my my wife at the time and they had her face down on the ground with a gun on her and they had guns pointed at all of us and they were looking for a white guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm being totally serious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, being black actually saved me from catching a hot one in the behind that day from the police. Um, and to know that this gentleman was like, Hey officer, by the way, I have a permit to carry a weapon because I live in an environment where carrying a weapon I feel is a necessity. And he got murdered for it <laughs> on, on live stream. And 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 we still didn't see the the nation explode over that. We saw Minneapolis somewhat explode, um, and then with the George Floyd protests that we saw, kind of globally, right? Uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that we're we were seeing we are seeing a far right movement in several governments. It ain't just here. Ask the cats in the UK. Aston Katz in Brazil. I was there. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing the the being cooped up inside your house from an invisible virus that you don't know how to fight. Because, again, with these far right regimes, they have been handling this pandemic horribly. And then couple that with the fact that. During all this, the police are still willy nilly you know, going crazy, killing colored folks. So that was my two cents. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think that, I think that all of those, all of those constellations, all of those stars that you are pointing to in the constellation that arose around those factors are absolutely correct. And I actually think that part of the reason in which we see Trump lose the election in November comes from those factors as well in that his failure to respond to not only the, the COVID-19, but his, his perverse reaction to the Black Lives Matter protests 
as well as you know the the sheer fatigue. I think that people. I think that Trump really uh, miscalculated the way people were reacted reacting to his playing. You know. You know. You know, hide and go seek with the Proud Boys. I think that he was not aware that in that debate that a lot of people were like, "Oh my God!" That that his kind of unability to really address white supremacy directly. That uh, that sh- I think that shocked a certain amount of voters, quite frankly. Yeah, that all of those things possibly uh, really co- co-op, co- co- created an ecosystem that made his presidency quite vulnerable because I'll be very honest with you. Had it not been particularly for COVID-19, I think Trump probably would have got reelected. I agree. I agree. You know, um, and I, I guess I want to just take one step back though. Uh, sure. The, the web, it's like, uh, apparently there's getting ready to be a right wing government in Spain. There's a, uh, uh, Portugal just had an election uh, too. Dude. You know, uh, the Philippines is, is oh. totally off the hook. I mean, you know, so you can go into Africa, you can go anywhere you want to, and you can see what's happening here. But I think the handling of the the pandemic, I think that's deliberate because there's there there's a necessity for right wing movements to have chaos to have calamities, to have societies collapse so that they can step in. The Yellow Jackets in France, say for instance, that's a right-wing movement that's and took over issues that affect the general population. Uh, and they got in there, organized and took advantage of it. And now they have a movement and people don't even know that it's a right-wing movement that's pushing against mm-hmm. the French mm-hmm. government, you know, mm-hmm. and the same thing in the Netherlands and so on. So what happens is that Trump, and it's not Trump, because Trump Trump is Johnny come lately, and Trump is an idiot. It's those yeah, people true. around him. It's those people that he put in place that's then changed the judiciary system here. It's those people that to, he put in place that's then change the regulations and the laws about the environment and the planet. It's those people that were put in place that's then just try to destroy the institutions that exist. That movement goes back. You can go 50, that movement was the movement we were talking about 50 years ago in the Black Panther Party. Mm-hmm. That movement is the movement that's back in the back, that's in the church that's in the suits and the ties and the briefcases. That movement is all throughout the government. They use that movement, but they can't destroy that movement because they are that movement. That's who they are. And that's just the ground face. That's their ground game. But their real game is back behind the the office doors, back behind the church, back behind the different place they've even evangelized the military yeah it was open for volunteers the people that control and maintain the real power in the military is white christian evangelist soldiers that's talking white supremacy you know and it's Mm -hmm. back behind all that you know and i think what happens is that a segment of the american population saw the possibility. We've always known that fascism exists. Yeah, We've always known that it was here. We've suffered from it the whole entire time. Now the American population in mass after the the Occupy Wall Street start seeing, oh my God, they'll do us like that too. And now they're starting to see when they came out, those elements that came out supporting Black Lives Matter say, oh, they'll beat us. Also, mm-hmm. uh, those elements now are starting to realize, oh, they're coming for us too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. now and now it's time for us to wake up mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, we're not black, but we're being treated. Like somebody even said that, like, you treat me like a black person. 
you know, it's like they're shocked. <laughs> but we've been saying this for 500 years, and now it's at their door. Yeah. Uh, someone's uh, Mike. Uh, Mike Cruz uh, says, when I moved home from college, I got pulled over for speeding. My car was packed with a TV, computer, etc. No questions from the cops about it, even with robberies in the area around that time. Uh, he goes on to say, I'm sure my experience would have been different if I were black. I was in rural Wisconsin, very conservative. Maybe. Uh, I did a show a few months back because uh, I, if, if you are new to this show, the show actually stems from me being a musician and touring for years all over this country and Canada and Europe, Mexico, and everything else. But uh, we were telling tour stories, a bunch of musicians we had on to do a show about race and heavy music. And there was an interesting story about uh, if you're familiar with the band Fear Factory, if you listen to heavy music, their, their the leader of the band is a Latin man, a very large Latin man. And they were trying to accuse him of, uh, of shooting somebody. Uh, pulled over the, the, the van and the trailer and all this other crap. And it. That stuff definitely does happen here and there, but I have seen, uh, I don't know if you guys know about this, but if you drive along the southern interstate of the United States, which I think is the 10 and the, or the 8, right, that you're driving alongside the border, so cops are trained to stop white women, because generally if it's a white woman in the car, she's transporting drugs because people think that she's not going to get har harassed. Wow. So as you drive along that interstate, you'll see like college students with their car just torn apart because they will take every door panel off everything and then just leave you. Mm. True story. Never let a disaster go to waste. Uh, didn't didn't they use the Katrina to reestablish uh, New Orleans? COVID-19 is America's Katrina, letting white supremacy keep the police state intact while silencing the left. And and bigger bigger than that, uh, it's also going to be a way for if you thought redlining was over after the Fair Housing Act, I got some bad news for you. COVID nineteen is is showing us some real time redlining, especially where I live here in Oakland. And I've said it. Well, on this one show. of the things I've always been worried worried about with COVID nineteen is the way in which capitalism was going to be restructured after that fact to make labor obsolete, whether through its artificial intelligence, you know, uh, you know, uh, robotics or whatever else, you know, these small businesses, these small restaurants, these small franchises that are going to be replaced now, what are they going to be replaced by the Amazon, by large bulk distributors, you know, so the question becomes exactly how is capitalism going to be reordered in a way in which the smaller size, you know, uh, small business owner or even the consumer is going to be left out because his labor is going to be erased. And that's something that I've always considered a, a possibility as a solution to the COVID economy by uh, the Lords of Capital. So, so you're saying that you, you see more like robotics in, in places like I Amazon? Think that, in other words, like if we can, if we can have people work from home, why mm -hmm. do we rent this office space? Why don't we cut mm -hmm. our, our labor by 65% have 41 work from home. Yeah. We can do the rest with artificial intelligence and we can save money with, with, with employment. And we'll, we'll, we'll find a way to make essential workers, you know, delegated out by artificial intelligence or robotic type labor. And who, you know, who knows how they're going to reorchestrate capitalism in a way because ca capitalism, you know, Marx said that, you know, technology is used for the purposes of making labor obsolete. So, I mean, eventually they're going to want to cut down the amount or the cost of labor or even either that or make it completely obsolete so they don't have to pay for it. So mm -hmm. one way or the other, they're going, to, they're going to either try to find some way to pay workers less or make workers disappear. And I think that COVID is an opportunity for them to, to devote more intellectual hours to try to find a way to make that happen. You know, you know, uh, too, I, I would add to that because we have been watching that. That's part of why the prison industrial complex has exploded over the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, we've watched manufacturing being offshore. This globalization thing is real. 
they have reached out around the world to get the lowest level wage labor force they could. You know, whether it's in Bangladesh or whether it's in uh, 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 South America, uh, they have people working for two dollars a day or less. Uh, and this is around the world. So they no longer need the American workforce. And in fact, that's what's happened. That's why you have uh, an explosion of prisons. These prisons that's, that's out in uh, rural America, uh, away from the cities, they are now the new manufacturing, they're now the new labor for America. They're concentration camps. And the people in those camps are those people, like I was saying earlier, like that earlier video said, uh, the labor force from the cities that are no longer employed. So you go to the inner cities, what you'll find is massive unemployment. And if you go out in a rural area, you'll find massive prison employment. Right. Because that's what's happening. And even though like robotics right now, it's only maybe 20 million or so robots on the planet, uh, that's coming. But the reality is that you can hire somebody in Sri Lanka, say for instance, for two dollars. Uh, right. Uh, you and and you see labor coming from all around the world and working under the table and and being abused and so on. I mean, it's a new slavery, and the ruling class, the ruling class has offshored this so. They're no longer connected to this flag or that flag. They're international. Yeah. And they and they have their own settings now. They have their own black water security forces. They are no longer concerned about what happens inside a national geographic boundary. And that's why they are pushing for a clash. Because if they if the population turns against each other, they're gonna sell weapons to both sides. They're going to sell medicine to both sides. They go into uh, Iraq and destroy it. And then 10 years later, they go in and build it. They make money from destroying it. And then they go back and they make money from rebuilding it. Same way with Syria, Lebanon, et cetera. So it's in their interest. These disasters is in their interest. And as they stand offshore, but not only offshore, they're talking about colonizing the moon. They're looking at going to Mars. They are actually, and I, I know they can't get away like that, but some of them see that as their future. Right. And they'll let Earth go to hell in a handbasket. Hmm. Uh, we have some, some interesting comments. This is why big tech is protecting and shielding Biden-Harris. So when big tech tells Biden-Harris to jump, they will say how high. Remember, our national security state is in Amazon's back pocket. I agree with that. And and I also uh, remind people that I don't know if cats remember during the what was a 2019 primary, uh, Kamala Harris was running on banning Trump's Twitter, not reigning in big tech, not, not breaking up monopolies, just banning Trump's Twitter. Uh, and she is a friend of big tech coming here from the Bay Area. Uh, Red Anson says uh, January 1st, 2009 through June 7th, 2020, U.S. police killed 16,900 people versus 26 in the U.K. Black people killed at a rate 2.5 times higher than white people. Capitalist realism and ideology conceals mass murder. Solidarity. Definitely solidarity. Uh, if you're coming from the U.K., definitely. Are you coming from the U.K.? I, I rather enjoy the UK. I don't know if you brothers have been there. Uh, Evan Moore says the new Jim Crow, even more effective. Another question I had for you guys, so we don't fall down this rabbit hole too much. Uh, oh, you're in Detroit. Oh, holla. Detroit metro area, because that is a rough part of town. And I have some funny that I'm not going to tell on camera stories about Detroit. <clears throat> um. So Black Lives Matter got nominated for the Nobel Prize. I don't know 
how I feel about that fully. I read an article on the in the Guardian about the nomination in general. Um, Pascal, I mean, it's it's I I think it for uh, I think Black Lives Matter is a liberal reformist organization that centers itself as a attempt to portray anti-racism in a way that is friendly to the ruling class. If we look at it that way, then we shouldn't be surprised that they get a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm not going to say that it's a horrible organization. I don't think it's a horrible organization, but I think that it's a liberal reformist organization. And in that being said, I think that it's, it, it makes sense to me that in an age in which we have global reactionary nationalism, in these terms of these right-wing rulers all over the world, why an organization like Black Lives Matter is being viewed as the effective countermeasure to these re racist reactionary leaders all over the world because it puts their politics on the spots global spot globally in a way that nothing else can do more effectively. So in mm -hmm. that sense, it's a it's actually a logical equation why Black Lives Matter would be nominated for the for the Nobel Peace Prize. How do you feel about that, Brother Conway? Well, you know, the, the Nobel Peace Prize, I mean, you know, uh, it, it comes out of dynamite, didn't it? Uh, explosives <laughs> and warfare, as far as I can remember. And it's given out by a bunch of 80-year-old white men, primarily. Uh, and so when you look at Obama, Obama got it. Obama uh, got it. You know, oh, that's Yeah, right. yeah. You know, and and he killed Gaddafi. He destroyed Libya. He uh, destroyed Syria. Uh, you know, afterwards, what you see is you see that they give this peace prize so that they can have some say so or control. When they lose that say so or control, like Dr. Martin Luther King got it, they kill you if you're no longer under that control. So. Uh, this is just another control mechanism that the the empire uses. Uh, it's like giving a knighthood to somebody. You know, now you have to walk the walk and you have to talk the talk and you have to be good in order to be recognized as that. But uh, and and I, I I'm not saying that Black Lives Matter is. Uh, anything at this point other than a civil rights movement. There's a lot of opportunists in there. There's a lot of people taking money in there. There's a lot of egotistical people taking money. But down on the ground, there's a lot of angry people also. And I say, and I will predict now, that some of those angry people are going to end up becoming revolutionaries in the future. When they look around and see the stuff that they're doing, it's not working and that they're spinning their wheels or they're being tricked, they're going to move on and they're going to move on to more serious stuff and more stronger stuff because that's how movements happen. People, people desire change the easiest possible way they can get it until they find out that they're not getting it. And then they'll desire change even in different manners. Uh, so I, I think, that we are looking into a future of angry, and this is the same thing that happened with Obama. Uh, everybody around the world was like jumping up and down, Obama, yay! Until they see what he did. He never closed Guantanamo. He never no. did anything. He deported more uh, 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 Latino people than anybody else on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, when people start understanding the difference between the rhetoric and the action, then they'll start changing how they see things. I did a show a, a, about a month ago with a friend of mine from school that is a uh, deportation defense attorney. And she's dealing with the case right now where a gentleman has won his case two times. He won his asylum case two times and they're trying him again. He was set up. Uh, as a young man by an informant that tattooed a gang symbol on him and he can't go back or he's afraid if he goes back to his native El Salvador where he hasn't been in like almost 30 years that he will be killed uh, upon arrival and he can either get out of jail uh, immigration jail where he's gotten COVID 
if he just agrees to go back or he can sit in there. I think his his new trial is coming up sometime this year. He's just got to sit in there and twiddle his thumbs until he gets a chance to have a third trial. Again, he won twice already, and they're appealing this to an even higher a higher court. Uh, to, and and when I asked the question, are the laws you're dealing with now new Trump era laws? She laughed in the show and goes, "No, this has been going on since the Clinton years." Mm. And the only difference is with these new administrations, it's extra forms and a few different procedures here and there. But a lot of these hurdles that we have are like Clinton era and before uh, uh, issues. So to, to, to Brother Conway's point about Obama and his horrible uh, policies, that yes, they are horrible policies. And I still don't understand how he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, I'm still trying to win a prize for being just black like that as well. Uh, Sister Diana Gwynn. Sister Diana. Uh, black people still being murdered by police every day. Obama got that fake symbol as well. And how being uh, innocent. How many innocent civilians did he kill? I, I don't know. Um, Michael Brown says, I read that Guardian article as well, not 100% clear on if BLM, the broader movement, or the organization was nominated for the Nobel Prize. Either way, who cares? LOL. Validation not needed. Um, Delbert uh, Sefton says, it's a bit tarnished today. I seem to remember the EU got it a few years ago, not to mention Kissinger. The EU got the Nobel Peace Prize? Who knows? What did they get it for? They just give it out to anybody nowadays. How much time do we have left for the mythical revolution? Ooh, that's a, you are really just. <laughs> uh, can we add Diana Spicy Gwen in that? No? Spicy. Uh, I do think it's important to draw a distinction uh, between BLM global network uh, official org and blm the broader and decentralized movement and sentiment in the streets that's a very good point but who gets to hold the nobel prize who gets the statue who gets the statue i think it's those three women and the started. check oh you do get a check don't you yeah yeah, sending people to a country where they have not been for decades is unethical. You you send them to poverty or die. It is, it is pretty effed up. And he was escaping. You know, again, if you listen to the show, uh, I have a podcast that I do for those that don't know. You can find it anywhere you find podcasts. Also called This Is Revolution. And uh, it's it's a very sad episode to me because you hear this man's story. He was fleeing. His family left El Salvador uh, because of the violence and because uh, their son had gotten uh, sexually assaulted. So good reason to leave, I think. Uh, at least the EU took millions of refugees and Kissinger, on the other hand. Yeah, Kissinger didn't take refugees. He definitely made refugees. And Delbert says, 2012, for over six decades, contributed to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy, and human rights in Europe. The dust had settled in the Balkans by then. Jesus Christ. And they gave them a Nobel Prize. And somebody quoted you, Brother Conway. It's like giving a knighthood. Facts! The UK version. Like when Obama gave Biden the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the US version. The Nobel Prize is proof that capitalism is a global project. Good quote. Oof, that's a good one. And on that note, uh, is there anything you want to add, uh, Mr. Conway? I, we've been talking to you for, for about an hour now. I know we only had you for a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. I just one final thing uh, to, uh, to the issue of the mythological revolution. People don't make revolution because they need something to do. Mm -hmm. People are forced into revolution because they have no other choices. And that happens when you, you can't feed yourself. You can't take have medicine. You can't have housing. You don't have jobs. Your children go to jail. Your family gets killed and shot down in the street. 
people are forced into those positions. Mm -hmm. And it is out of desperation. There is no other choices that cause people to decide to change their government, to decide to change their condition, to decide to take control of the resources so they can take care of themselves. So there's no, there's no mythological revolution. There's every revolution that happens is forced on people because they don't have a choice. I agree. That is Eddie Conway, host of Rattling the Bars on the Real News. Well, what time does it come on? It's on every day. You just go on the internet and punch up the real news. And if you want to see my show, it's mm -hmm. Rattling the Bars. Uh, and you just go down the list of, from the from the uh, homepage and you can find it. Thank you very much for your time. Tell Cameron we said thank you again for reaching out to us. Really, really, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very um, much for the getaway. All right, I enjoyed this too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, take care. All right, bye. -bye. That was Brother Eddie Conway from the Real News, Black Panther, formerly incarcerated author. One thing I didn't get a chance to say on air: uh, Eddie Conway started a labor union while he was uh, incarcerated. Wow. And like literacy programs and political education programs and it, it says a lot about uh, one's character <laughs> when you do that when you're when you're uh, unjustly uh, incarcerated. So, and uh, if you're still listening, Mr. Conway, uh, Ashley Costa Fleck, a hey, shout out to Ashley. A uh, big supporter of the Bitter Lake Band. Appreciate you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Conway. I appreciate your insight. Riverman, no choice. You're right, Mr. Conway. Poor people fed up like the dance hall song. Yup. Uh oh, spicy. The time for revolution is now, today, before it's too late. Too late. Brother Brown, Brother Eddie Conway's bookshelf looks immaculate and really good point about who is going to accept that Nobel Peace Prize and receive the funds on behalf of BLM. What if Obama just like took it on behalf <laughs> Coming of to a second time? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs> it was all me. BLM born out of the Trayvon Martin murder during the Obama administration. And during a black DOJ as well. Yep. Two black DOJs. Two. Not one, but two. Like the count. Two. Two black DOJs. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, is there anything else you uh, you want to discuss, Pascal, before we go? I appreciated having Brother Eddie on. You know, he was um, kind with his time and it was very educational. So doing this show is a, a passion project, if you will. And if you guys would like to see the show grow, become a patron. Subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube, YouTube channel page. as well. Like uh, the page. Thumbs like up. Page. All that share the show when you get it. Uh, Sign on to be a Patreon. Uh, Katie Halper shared the show uh, that we did with the uh, Fred Hampton's lawyers. Um, yeah, it was a great show. So thank you very much again, Katie Halper. And coming up, a Tuesday we'll be speaking with uh, Professor Dylan Rodriguez, author of the book White Reconstruction. Um, and also been taking some, some personal heat. He actually got some death threats for some uh, pro-Palestine comments that he made, um, like some very serious death threats. People actually threatened his family, and I am, I'm real big about. Uh, you can say what you want to me. Um, definitely don't put my family in it because this is not that uh, internet space where, uh, like, I first of all, I don't really like to yell at people. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent so much of my time traveling. I will see you. 
and you will catch these things. <laughs> These hands. You think I'm playing? That's the funny part. That's why I don't really talk shit on here, man. This shit ain't funny. Uh, Eddie Conway is so inspiring. Independent educators are needed now more than ever. Public education, big government, and businesses are the root cause of our crippling society. The revolution is an everyday battle. Heart. Hugs to you too, uh, Ash. Do you have anything to say on that, real quick, before we before we sign off? I, I co-sign absolutely, man. Um, we had a stream Thursday it did get pulled down because Pascal was right and I fucked up and I put copyrighted material to start the show and YouTube totally pulled the stream down and right before I did it Pascal goes that seems a little copyrighty and I was like ah ah you worry too much and sure enough the next morning I get an email that said the stream was taken down and it literally took from my computer crashing several times yesterday, 12 hours to put it up, edit it. So you can enjoy on YouTube now <laughs> an edited version of the stream. Patreon will have uh the full the full stream with the with the clip that I that I took from uh this the Wall Street sequel. Um Gordon Gecko, I think is an odious character that people love for some reason and i felt that i think i titled the episode uh uh gordon gecko takes over reddit (laughs) because i felt like that reddit vibe had a lot of that going on um now going to watch the black messiah film oh no boycotting the hollywoodization of black uh liberation movements we're looking forward to your show your after show after watching the film with Fred Senior's lawyers. Yeah, so uh, about that, I was trying to set it up where we could stream it, maybe even on Twitch, and I found out that only Amazon movies you can stream on Twitch. Oh. While you watch. And that's not an Amazon movie, but there is a movie on Amazon that I did want to stream on Twitch, uh, and maybe, just maybe, we can get some of our, uh, our colored friends to watch it with us. Uh, it's the new movie called American Skin. Uh, it's a Nate. Oh, uh, I heard about that. Where he basically, a brother, take he kidnaps the police. It's a revenge, it's a revenge thriller about a cop, yeah. a kid whose father, a guy whose son's killed by a cop. Yeah, Nate Silver. Yeah, no, oh, he's always no, not Nate Silver. Nate, Nate Parker. Nate, Nate Parker. Silver. Nate Parker. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nate Parker's always with the revenge with the black folks. Well, he did the he did the um he did the um Nat Turner film Nat Turner, that he yeah. called Birth of a Nation. That friend of show friend in real life uh, fellow albany high cougar uh uh kelly deets was an advisor on true that um so i definitely want to try to watch that on a stream um that would probably be fun we probably have to do it on twitch only i'm tired of having this shit get taken down but i definitely want to do that and i want to do and i'm, I'm going to be talking to some guys about doing a pre-super bowl show where we can do our topic about the neoliberalization or the gentrification of sports. We, that's a sport. good subject. We're going to get into that. So this is what's coming up. White Reconstruction is Tuesday. Um, get ready for the Tuesday show. There's definitely podcasts dropping. There's a new podcast dropping tomorrow with Professor, Professor Michael Harris. Who wrote the book welcome to the rebellion a new hope in politics about uh using uh, star wars as a grand narrative for the left and also using star wars to show where the left is failing um and he wrote a new book uh that i have an advanced copy of uh uh called uh stay alive using the hunger Games series as a grand narrative for capitalism's collapse so we, what did Riverman say? Watch separately, then review and comment on the film. Anyhow, that's that's the plan. I think we're all going to watch it and and get back and do a show with those guys again because I really want to hear their take. And maybe we can get uh, Eddie Conway in there too because he was not in Chicago, but he definitely was with the Panthers. And maybe we can get like as many ex like 60s revolutionaries as possible <laughs> all in one room with popcorn <laughs> all in all in one all in one big thing we can get everybody's take on it because the my take is always going to be from the lens of knowing what happened 
and not being around in that era. And I love getting people's take that were actually there when the shit was going down. Because that's that, that's coming from a whole different world. And they're really going to understand the portrayals a lot more. And I know, like I, I had said on the show several times that I'm afraid that having an actor of the caliber of Lakeith Stanfield um, playing William O'Neill he he's just he's just going to humanize O'Neill and that, and maybe the story will um and somebody had responded on Twitter they were like oh no Fred Hampton's family was involved so that's not going to happen that's not going to be the case and you know there was a whole entertainment uh, weekly cover page article on Lakeith Stanfield playing the role and <sighs> We'll see, right? We shall we'll see. see. So, that being said, I know there's some sports fans in the captions, in the comments. I mean, who do you guys have in the Super Bowl? Is it a Chiefs repeat? Is this the fall of Tom Brady? Or will Tom Brady be much like Peyton Manning, the only quarterback? or the second quarterback to win a Super Bowl on two different teams. We shall see. But until then, Tuesday, Dylan Rodriguez. Tomorrow, listen to the podcast. A new one drops. Become a patron, and you can hear that shit now. And you get all the bonus content from all the shit that we do. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. I'm going to go chase a two-year-old. Pascal, what are you about to do? Uh, to do Miami have shit? Brunch. Have brunch? brunch? That yeah. is some fancy Miami shit. It's breakfast and lunch, man. <laughs> Is it going to be Cuban? No, it's going to be eggs and bread. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. We are out. <laughs>